Milia Islamia, and my colleague and also a co-organizer of this conference, Farhana, who is currently working as a PhD scholar at the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia. Her areas of interest are memory studies and cultural studies. She is pursuing her PhD on the works of Orhan Pamuk and particularly the idea of melancholia that runs through it. Mm. The rapporteur for this session is Saima Malik, also a PhD scholar at the department. This talk will be followed by a question and answer round. So please post your questions in the chat box and it will be addressed to Professor Lockhurst at this end of his talk. So I would now like to hand over the virtual mic to Farhana and request her to introduce our very first keynote speaker. Thank you, Soumya. And uh, it is my utmost privilege to introduce the very first keynote speaker of our conference, Professor Roger Lacast. Professor Lacast is currently the Geoffrey Tillotson Chair of 19th Century Studies at Burbank University of London. He's the author of several books on science fiction and Gothic literature and the horror film. He had also published The Trauma Question in 2008, and he's currently working on the global history of the graveyard. That being said, I would also like to introduce the speech, uh, title of the speech that he's going to deliver today. Questions for the floor, the linking coloniality and trauma. The session is also being recorded and it is simultaneously being live streamed on YouTube for our subscribers and audience. So over to you, sir. Uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much. That's uh, fantastic and, and great privilege to be uh, invited. Quite daunting to be invited um, to start this off because um, it kind of puts me in a in a place of contradiction, really. You know, you I, I should really be the last person you ask, you know, sitting here in in, in London, freezing cold London uh, and um, dictating what you should say uh, about the global south. Ridiculous, preposterous. Uh, position. So that's partly why um, I've called it questions for the floor. So I'm going to uh, phrase a series of of, um, of questions, uh, which I'm hoping that um, don't don't tell you what to, what to say or what to do, but are actually, you know, some of the thoughts that I've had um, since publishing that book uh, on on trauma and how the how the whole field really has kind of changed and transformed. So um, I, I often improvise these kinds of things, but it's it's just too thorny and too difficult. So I'm going to read something to you, which I think is about uh, 30, 35 minutes. But, I, you know, the whole point is to have questions for the floor. Uh, so I'll try and leave space for, for, for that. And I'll, I'll just shut up if I go on too long. OK, so I, I, I guess you've invited me because I published the trauma question in 2008. And that's 16 years ago. It was mainly written as well between 2005 and 2007, and looking at cultural forms mainly in the UK, uh, some in France and also in America. And that, that was a particular kind of cluster of things that peaked uh, in the 1990s. Um, so to state the obvious, it is a book that is like me, quite old by now. Uh, and, um, and and definitely needs some kind of re set of reformulations. I think we'd expect the paradigm of trauma and the field of trauma studies to change through that time, and I believe it has quite substantially. Um, my question, first question for the floor, there were five questions. First question for the floor would be, um, has trauma studies yet gone far enough from its sources in the global north and how far does it need to go uh, to, to kind of move beyond that paradigm. So just to rehearse some of the um, work that I was doing in that book, the genealogy of the concept of trauma starts from the heart of European modernity. And in my study, it's about train wrecks in the 1860s the rise of psychodynamic models of mind, such as dissociation, psychic splitting, memory disorder, uh, and also the Freudian model of repression from about 1870 uh, to 1900. And it also then gets associated with, particularly with war trauma from about the 1890s onwards, starting with symptoms in soldiers, variously called nostalgia, I think we all suffer from nostalgia now, um, 
and uh, shell shock, uh, battle fatigue. And it ends up in 1980 with this category PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And that arrival in 1980 was something that I was trying to kind of unravel, trying to get at. I think it binds together lots of separate strands from the 1970s. So the treatment of Vietnam veterans by uh, a whole host of advocates in the psychiatric um, area. The rise of feminist theory, uh, demanding a psychic description for the aftermath of rape or, or sexual uh, abuse or systemic patriarchal uh, violence. And also very important, the emergence of the concept of the survivor, which actually only, only happens really in the 1970s. We start using that term in the 1970s. And of course, we associate that mostly with uh, Holocaust survival, but, but also other you know, major historical ruptures, traumas, and so on. So when I was writing that, it already felt quite complicated to me, uh, quite quite complex and overdetermined. Lots of moving parts to try and work with, and it was already challengingly multidisciplinary. And that's what you you have to be in in this field. But looking back at it, it's also fairly silent on context outside the Anglo-American, or more broadly, what we might call Western modernity, since the psychodynamic model of, of trauma was largely built by psychiatrists in France, in Austria, and in Germany in the late 19th century. Uh, but also India, if you include uh, doctors like um, James S. Dale in the, in, in the colonial period. Um, this bracketing of other contexts was just about, I would say, in 2008, justifiable. And certainly none of the um, readers of that book, so that you hand in a manuscript and it gets read by other scholars. I had five readers for that book. None of them uh, said this is um, unacceptably narrow in its cultural uh, reference points. So question two uh, for the floor would be, is that kind of bracketing that we so often do uh, in the Western uh, University is that justifiable anymore? I think surely not. It can't be um, right now in an increasingly kind of globalised world. And it can't be from someone sitting in a study in London um, talking to you know, a lively group of uh, early career scholars in Delhi. It just seems uh, unacceptable, inappropriate. We need to kind of open, open that out much more. Um, looking back on the short conclusion, uh, to the trauma question. Um, there is a last couple of pages, um, which is the beginnings of gestures to think beyond the historical and cultural frame that I just set up and just examined. And I noted the rise of the concept of resilience in particular, which is actually a kind of anti-traumatic concept, uh, a refusal or a supersession of the idea that trauma remains and has to remain uh, determining or in some way must remain unalleviated to be properly uh, ethical. The use of the term resilience has only grown in the years since, so I'm quite pleased with spotting that kind of uh, trend. No institutional sentence, no vision statement uh, can, can survive without using the word resilience at some point. And that sort of says something about um, both trauma and and um, re resilience to trauma uh, that's that's gone into the culture. And then I noted just a few signs of wanting to challenge the unstated ethnocentric assumptions in the field of trauma studies. So there are early books in the 1990s, like um, Rethinking the Trauma of War from 1998, which linked to emerging ideas about the possible limits of simply transplanting uh, the abstracted psychical mechanism of trauma into contexts of wars or uh, humanitarian interventions in places such as, at that time, uh, the Congo, Sudan, Rwanda, uh, Iraq, all of those sorts of areas. Uh, that's, that's good to spot as well, but there is, um, embarrassingly, precisely one paragraph uh, on uh, indicating that at the end of the book. Um, it's striking that although the book 
was written and researched entirely in the shadow of the Iraq war from 2003 onwards. Uh, the place of that war, its huge ongoing catastrophic consequences is largely a kind of uh, absent presence. I see it there all the time. Abu Ghraib photographs are talked about, but 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 really, it's it, it is the framework for the, for that book. But in a way, it can't get quite get into the frame yet. And quite interesting. Now, I've written subsequently on the Gothic and and science fiction studies mainly since two thousand and eight. Uh, but I have, of course, been asked every now and then to to write on trauma, and I've just been noticing how my own kind of sets of, of frames change and alter, um, particularly looking at um, work around Iraq and Afghanistan in this framework. Um, those pieces at least have begun to incorporate work, say, by uh, Iraqi writers, uh, Ahmed Sadawi's amazing Frankenstein in Baghdad, uh, or Sinan Antoun, um, The Corpse Washer, or Has Hassan Blasim's uh, very productive work as well, very provocative work. Um, that kind of approach, so in other words, looking at, at, at narratives like Kevin Powers on war trauma with American soldiers, but then also countering it with um, narratives from the Iraq perspective, that seems not just important now, but absolutely unavoidable. You this is just what we need to do. Um, and so we have perhaps now, which we didn't have in the early part of the 21st century, is this idea of the transnational. The transnational literature is really something that is, a, is I think, a different paradigm from the, from the post-colonial, and, and, and that's been something that's been very productive, uh, I think. It started to change our focus of attention. The other crucial thing that's changed, I think, for, for us um, in narrow, privileged Western universities is just that the digital world has opened up the possibilities uh, and the economies of publishing and, and of making other uh, work from different cultures much more accessible. Um, and, and we come uh, from a pre-digital age where that was so, so difficult to, to, to get hold of materials um, before, and now that is, that, that's not so much an issue. So the scholars who really engaged with trauma in a properly post-colonial uh, paradigm, such as uh, my long uh, good friend, uh, Steph Kraps, who uh, you're speaking to, that's, that's exactly the person you should be speaking to. Um, and his work on the post-colonial and post-colonial witnessing is a central place, surely, uh, to start the difficult work of what we might call after Dipesh uh, Chak Chakravarti's work, provincializing the concept of trauma. Uh, that is understanding its local origins in very narrow European ideas that might need pluralizing at the very least. Uh, and I noted just to having a, a look around um, a 2020 book collection that came out uh, called Places of Traumatic Memory, a Global Context. So very much trying to um, uh, think you know, beyond the, the usual frame. Um, they begin their uh, introduction by just saying, in all cultures, in all languages, in all places, humans suffer trauma. The ways in which we remember and acknowledge that experience, however, often depend on tools individual cultures provide. So that's a kind of start, key starting point uh, for everyone now, I think. So that seems, of course, like a positive appeal to diversifying the context of trauma. But here's the third question for the floor. Does the post-colonial paradigm itself do enough to decenter, pluralize, de- and then recontextualize the concept of trauma? How much could or should survive of trauma, the concept of trauma? Um, in this process of cultural transplantation and multiplication. So the theoretical frame that um, I want to take from the global south and bring into play here is not necessarily the subaltern one and not the post-colonial theory associated, say, with uh, Homi Baba, who many moons ago taught me um, after a fashion. Um, instead, I want to look at the critique of the post-colonial paradigm and the emergence of this idea of decoloniality. And in particular, uh, I've been working with the critique of 
the modernity slash coloniality matrix of power that's been developed in the Latin American context by theorists close to the Peruvian sociologist uh, Anibal Quijano uh, and her intellectual ally and successor, the Argentinian cultural and literary theorist Walter Mignolo. Um, here is the challenge that they pose uh, and that I'll put in front of you as my fourth question. Basically, these questions are all the same, but they're different, kind of modulated in a different sort of way. The fourth question then is, in the pursuit of what Quijano and Mignolo term delinking of operative concepts from the frameworks of the colonial matrix of power, do we have a model for the kind of work that needs to be done on trauma in order to make it operative for specific formations in the global south? The output of the cluster around uh, Quijano and Mignolo may very well be familiar to you, um, or it might not be familiar at all. Uh, after all, this is from a very different part uh, of the Global South, a term which is itself an abstraction uh, and simplification, and we obviously need to start to pull that apart. So excuse me if I just uh, outline quickly two central elements from Mignolo in particular, uh, and to just gloss a couple of his ideas. Um, the key idea for me is um, that he says there can be no modernity without coloniality, that we need to say them both together always as coloniality slash modernity or the other way around. However much the body of Western philosophy or critical theory wants to abstract a universal modernity beyond the horizon of historical and structural violence on which it relies. Mignolo and his group focused on analyzing and critiquing the coloniality of the knowledge power matrix in order, Mignolo says, to quote him, to open up the reconstruction and restitution of silenced histories, repressed subjectivities, subalternized knowledges, uh, and languages performed by the totality depicted under the names of modernity and rationality. So what's it aimed for beyond the critique of the colonial matrix of power is what Mignolo and Catherine Walsh call in their book on decoloniality. That's probably the best place to start, certainly was for me. Uh, call, they call this decolonial pluriversality. To interrupt, to quote them, the idea of dislocated, disembodied, disengaged abstraction, and to disobey the universal signifier that is the rhetoric of modernity, the logic of coloniality, and the West's global model. Beyond uh, first, the second, third world models, or beyond binary north south global models, they want instead to respond to a multipolar world order that resists the rhetoric of modernity still mired in what they call unidirectional and unipolar uh, trajectories. <clears throat> the initial stage of this critical theory is to actively engage in what Annabel Quijano called delinking. So that's the other kind of concept I just want to um, tug out a little bit. Delinking recognizes the roots of certain concepts and discourses, or indeed whole epistemological paradigms, in the Western colonial matrix of power. It then aims to decouple or delink concepts from this matrix to work with and against them to reach engagement with other systems of thought that are local, specific, indigenous, fugitive, migrant. I'm interested to note that the project of delinking uses in an unacknowledged way, actually, the language of trauma itself. In his long essay called Delinking, Mignolo says that it is informed by, quote, the wounds and histories of humiliation that offer a point of a reference for decolonial and epistemic and political projects. The word wounds, of course, uh, evoking the original sense of trauma as a physical injury or wound marked physically on the body. 
And when he talks about recovering silenced histories or repressed subjectivities, that is also a language we commonly find inside the trauma paradigm. But a crucial position in Mignolo's work is to suggest that delinking goes much further than the post-colonial paradigm, which he suggests remains far too dependent on modernity's colonial matrix of power. Mignolo explicitly wants to shift from the post-colonial to the decolonial frame. That's the kind of language we've seen in the Western Academy across the 2010s, I think, but accelerating particularly after the campus crisis induced by Black Lives Matter uh, and the demand to decolonize the curriculum, which is an ongoing kind of campaign and absolutely mired in culture wars in both America and uh, the UK and Europe as well, increasingly. Mignolo's essay, Delinking, from 2007, already names Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak and Homi Baba as merely offering, to quote him, scholarly transformations, his words, scholarly transformations of modernity informed by intellectuals that remain embedded in the institutions of Western modernity, even in their own internal critiques of it. So uh, critiques offered, say, by Michel Foucault, by Jacques Derrida or Jacques Lacan. These frameworks, Mignolo suggests, remain insufficient to push proper pluriversality and the decolonization of knowledge. Now, that's a really grand claim, big claim, given the kind of work that Foucault, or Derrida, or figures like um, Jean-François Lyotard published, which were explicit critiques of the underpinning violence in various kinds of ways uh, of um, philosophical horizons of modernity. So after that somewhat compressed, forgive me, um, explication of delinking, question five is really the crucial question for the floor. Is it that the concept of trauma itself emerging from the centers of Western modernity is just too fatally compromised to be expected to survive this much more theoretically austere project of decolonial delinkage? With trauma, let's face it, it's hard to think of a concept more entirely embedded in modernity. And that means, according to Mignolo, that it must also be equally connected to the colonial matrix of power. And when you start to read him and start to think back about uh, the genealogy that I was exploring, there's a whole aspect there that, that could be kind of opened up. So if trauma arrives from the technological ensemble of the European railway, so railway crashes and psychical traumas from those, that's what uh, Wolfgang Schivelbusch and other historians uh, have argued. Wasn't the railway one of the principal devices for pushing colonial settlement and administrative control of colonized populations in America, in the Indian subcontinent, in Africa? Cecil Rhodes' uh, dream of the Cape to Cairo railway, a constant theme in his rhetoric in the 1880s and 1890s was integral to his vision of ensuring the global reach of technologically interconnected white races. And if trauma also takes its main sources from the context of the newly mechanized total war at the end of the 19th century, then war trauma must also be intertwined with the matrix of colonial wars uh, which proved the testing ground for so many aspects of modern warfare from the genocidal logic against the Zulus or Matabili, uh, pursued by the British, or by the extermination of the Herero and Namaka populations in, Germ in, in Africa, in, in, South, in, in the German colonies in Africa between 1904 and 1908. What does it mean then if delinking demands what seems to be a very radical evisceration of the concepts of moder modernity, including a concept like trauma. Mignolo does not seem especially sympathetic to the idea of placing concepts sous rature or under erasure uh, 
uh, as Jack Derrida did in his early work. So he would literally cross out, use the word being, but then literally put crosses through it. So um, it's a visible crossing out on the page that shows you that he want, he he has to use the concept, but doesn't want to, but there's no other concept. So he's he's kind of playing with ideas of, of, of putting ideas under erasure. And, you know, should we do that with, with trauma as well? Um, if we were to follow Mignolo's logic all the way through, what would be left of trauma uh, after the proper delinkage of the concept from modernity slash coloniality? Should the multiple, irreducible, pluriversal, local, indigenous histories meant to emerge from delinkage, delinkage effectively have to leave that concept behind? Uh, I don't have an answer for this. I'm coming to a conclusion. Um, and that's perhaps because I realize it's precisely not my place to have that answer. Precisely not here in London, not now, speaking to you in your context. The answer would surely have to emerge, not from any authority invested in a keynote, um, but from a multiplicity of voices from the global south that I hope we're going to get to hear uh, in the conference. So I've just refused to answer my own question or come down, actually, from the level of abstraction. And that felt a little bit like a feeble get out for uh, a conclusion. So um, let me just tell you quickly about how I've been trying to concretize these ideas in a, in a recent project. Um, so I'm involved, like so many academics these days, in one of those gigantic handbooks You've all seen them, you know, it's like endless kind of handbooks from Rutledge. Uh, so I think you have uh, a, a good relationship with as well. Um, it's in this particular case, I'm one of the four editors of um, a, a handbook for horror studies. Um, but we've within a particularly uh, extended global kind of context. That's our um, project. It's going to be half a million words long. Uh, it's already got too many writers to ever wrangle in any way at all. Um, and it, the four editors do, we uh, constantly note to ourselves, come from the global north, which is not a great start. But we do have lots and lots of connections out now to scholars outside these predictable um, northern networks. Um, and particularly actually in the uh, in the Pacific Rim um, is is the area we've been looking at. So Japan and Korea for, for kind of obvious reasons, if you know horror studies. Um, and we've got voices from, uh, I think, five continents. So that's what, you know, that's what we're aiming for. Um, now, as editors, we've struggled endlessly with the problem of trying to provincialize Europe um, in the project to displace or dethrone narratives that see the genre of horror uh, as a narrative of diffusion uh, from origins in the 18th century European context, uh, which then goes on to American horror uh, film, which is the next kind of, you know, center of gravity, as it were. So everything else then becomes just a secondary addition to those core locations. That's a narrative of diffusion from center to periphery that we always wanted to displace. We were determined to try and displace that. But how to do it, how to do that act of decentering? Could we find a way to tell not a single origin story of horror located in publishing houses in London, Paris, or Berlin, which then simply works to accumulate in an additive way, a set of subsequent additions, add-ons, um, to this narrow formulation of the Gothic. In the end, we didn't think that simply adding different national traditions, let's have an essay on Japanese horror, Korean horror, Spanish horror, Canadian horror, Brazilian horror, Indian horror, uh, could ever do more than reinforce the unit of the nation, which uh, we saw as needing displacement itself. I mean, nationalism is it's essential to the project of modernity uh, in a certain form. So it also very quickly came to seem arbitrary and suppressing the increasingly transnational and intercultural ch exchanges that typify a genre like, like the Gothic or horror in the 21st century, but actually have done so right from the very beginning of that genre in the 18th century, since its origins are very heavily located in colonial modernity in the 18th century. 
So what level of analysis would work to de-link horror from the model of a distinct national history, but which did not reach too far in the other direction and propose a sort of frictionless, globalized notion of horror, a set of just uh, just a set of traveling tropes that reaches everywhere and nowhere in the same kind of way. This appeal to globalized horror texts often risks simply asserting a model of diffusion again, an anglicized or Americanized uh, Gothic undergoing local transformation and mutation. So in the end, we've started, uh, and this is maybe a question for the floor as well, does this work? Uh, what we've done is um, an experiment really of um, thinking at the level of the continent uh, of including a set of seven polylogues for seven continents of the of the planet of studiously equal length, uh, weaving together lots of voices um, from uh, short answers that we've um, posed in um, a set of questions sent out um, through uh, through um, email. Um, we're hoping that we're going to try and multiply the voices as much as possible through the kind of randomness of email chains, you know, so that so that we're asking people, well, send it on to somebody else what, and, and see what we get that isn't it necessarily in our control uh, and try and get them to a point where we've got multipolar uh, conceptions going on. Will that work? Um, will it answer some of the challenges set by Mignolo's challenging questions? Uh, we don't know yet. We're still kind of working with this idea. But I do see, just to finish, um, a parallel to the kind of work that needs to be done with a concept like trauma. After all, the culture of horror uh, has many overlaps with how um, trauma also finds its articulation in culture. Uh, in fact, horror narratives are one of the principal ways in which you know cultural narratives of trauma um, work their way uh, into presence so in this sense the conference that you have convened here is another experiment in seeking a pluriversal approach to trauma studies let's hope so which means i think it's really time for me to shut up and give over the space to questions from the floor so thank you for your attention and thank you again for the invitation Thank you so much, Professor Lacoste, for that uh, very intriguing speech, I must say. I mean, you have posed several questions for the floor and uh, uh, this very title of trying to de-link trauma and coloniality, it's itself very nuanced and a very complex topic to actually, you know, comment because it, it would require one to uh, specifically go back to several historical legacies and the impact that is that it has had and uh, it's going through. So um, that being said, also the several questions that you have had in your uh, speech, I'm sure our conference is the very, uh, you know, it's trying to exactly attend to that. It's the very uh, motive of this entire conference is to try to bring about narratives around the global South from uh, the global South point of view. So uh, I think uh, the questions, if not now, then at least throughout the three days conference that we are going to have, I'm sure we'll come up with various answers to that um, from the presenters or our audience here and uh, everyone around. Um, I wouldn't um, take much of time, but um, I'd uh, like to pass on to the moderator of the session, Soumya, to kindly go through uh, the questions of our audience here and comments. So over to you, Samia. Thank you so much, Farhana. And thank you so much, Professor Roger Luckhurst, for that very comprehensive speech. You have traced a genealogy of trauma and also commented about the Iraq war, about how uh, what Chinua Achebe says, that there should be a balance of stories, not only from the global north, but also from the global south, not only American soldiers' war experiences, but also from the civilians and people in Iraq. And then you also pointed about uh, pointed out about uh, the term global south itself. And if the term itself is an abstraction, maybe some of our paper presenters would try to uh, try to, you know, uh, look into that. And then you have also put ideas about uh, what would happen to trauma itself if it's delinked. So 
very interesting speech, I must say. And uh, uh, thank you so much for it. And uh, I would like to pass on to uh, our first uh, uh, participant. Uh, Nishat ma'am has a question. So uh, ma'am, should we unmute you? Ma'am, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, now, am I audible? Yes. So, uh, thank you very much, Professor Lakhurst, for this, um, uh, for uh, throwing so many questions at us. And um, so, I was, um, you know, uh, 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 you set me thinking when you, uh, you know, when you began with your point one uh, as the first question as the point of de uh, departure, and uh, it just brought to my mind this work by Nicole M. Risotto in Surgeon Testimonies, in which she says that writers like, you know, Joseph Conrad and uh, Anglo-Irish Rebecca West and uh, 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 Kenyan Nugugiwa Thango, you know, she says uh, that their mode of witnessing invite us to uh, reassess divisions and classifications in literary studies that generate such categories as modernist, colonial, post-colonial, national, and world literatures. So do you subscribe to her view or do you have uh, an opinion which is uh, contrary to hers? What would you say? Uh, what happened? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I found, so I, I, I think I've always had a slight um, anxiety about post-colonial uh, as it was as it was framed in the um in the academy a little bit um and I, I and and i found increasingly that the transnational is a better kind of framework for that because it's precisely um about a kind of dynamic movement and often i think it it kind of helps it dealings from um from the colonial more productively I think so that we're kind of caught, not caught in that um reactive model of of of, of, of post-colonial kind of writing sometimes that it gets caught in um I mean I would say um you know Mignolo's yeah, I find work I find incredibly provocative um uh, and also it's 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 problematic obviously and people have taken have taken issues uh, with it but it's also a bit rich for for someone to kind of critique um, uh, an internal, you know, you're stuck inside the internal academy uh, when you're writing in Duke University uh, about, about this, um, because that's, you know, one of the kind of um, most complicit uh, in terms of how Duke is funded uh, from tobacco money, uh, how it's how how caught up it is, how everyone is caught up in this, how everyone is kind of complicit and that we need to kind of work, work, work through with that. So I, I found uh, his ideas provoking and helpful in um, trying to get to a much more fluid transnational kind of concept where where things are are moving unpredictably. So there isn't this kind of um, diffusion narrative, as I was saying, from you know centre to periphery, but that actually you know when you look at uh, movement between is when it becomes really crucial. So. One of the most pleasing things that I do to my students to, to when they are being introduced to the Gothic is explain to them in architectural terms how the Gothic arch is the key defining um, shape and structure of uh, Gothic architecture. And it's it was promoted in the Gothic revival uh, all the way through the 19th century as the quintessential English thing. It is, of course, an Islamic structure. Uh, and um, it's something that actually was brought back from, um, you know, the, the Middle Eastern escapades uh, of the Crusaders and others. Uh, and, and this sort of sense in which a foundational national narrative, um, the Gothic represents English democracy and refusal of tyranny and all those sorts of things, um, is, actually, is actually coming from uh, exactly its other. So in, in that sort of sense, it's it, it's really helpful to be able to see from the beginning uh, 
this idea uh, of, um, of of kind of constant movement and communication intercultural exchange. And I think you can do a lot of that work with trauma as well. Um, and I would write that genealogy, I think, in a completely different way now, 16 years on, just because I think having, you know, worked um, a, a lot on um, late Victorian um, work set like Ryder Haggard set in South Africa and so on, you kind of, you understand much more about the, about the, the constant flow back to um, Europe for these really kind of quintessential um, uh, Western ideas. Um, and not least that, you know, Freud um, would, um, when he had a disappointing session with um, a patient uh, and they were not very impressed with him, he gave them copies of Ryder Haggard to read because he just said, one day I will write something as brilliant and, 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 and as great as this, but, you know, sorry, I haven't yet, but here's some Ryder Haggard. Um, and that sort of sense of, of, again, you know, at the core of, of quite a lot of our uh, concepts is this foundational transnational intercultural kind of set of exchanges. And that's probably something we need to look at much more. Um, it's a very rambling answer, sorry, but I think that's um, uh, my sense is that I'm suspicious slightly of post-colonial um, as a paradigm that maybe we need to move beyond uh, or, or to trouble more. Um, world literatures is also, as we know, a much debated kind of concept. So, um, but I think I've found more kind of product, productive kind of ideas in um, in Mignolo's kind of provo provocative work. Shut up. I have another question. Uh, of course. And um, uh, you talked about resilience. Now that we are talking about post memories and transmission of trauma. Uh, transgenerational trauma and uh, transgenerational transmission. Now, when transgenerational transmission enters the core of the discussion, how does it uh, transform uh, our way of thinking on trauma? You know, because it just complicates, uh, you know, our, you know, the interplay of the various vectors within uh, the hierarchical uh, structures of trauma. Uh, I mean, how does the repetition of uh, uh, both the resilience and the wounds in the uh, transgenerational transmission, how does it complicate uh, things as such? Or yeah, does it a... uh, actually lead to some kind of uh, another set of problems? That's a really good uh, set of questions there, actually. Um, I'm always struck by um, where resilience initially comes from. Uh, and so we had a set of trauma paradigms that were really about, um, you know, a universalized kind of concept of, and, and increasingly people were saying, you know, everyone experiences trauma in exactly the same way. But what was the what, what was the problem? What was the point of uh, resistance to this? Well, how is it these very privileged uh, American psychiatrists were asking, how is it that these kids from the ghetto, from African-American kind of culture, survive? Um, um, how, how do they get through this with with some of them profoundly traumatized and fitting their model perfectly, but so many others just gliding through that? What is that about? So it had a kind of a sense of of a of a racial origin from the beginning, uh, and and resilience is a is you know something that you've seen drift into um, all kinds of places, um, but it does again, you know, it's worth exploring that, that genealogical origin. It's not the only place it comes from, but, but that idea of, of, of actually people are in a way othering, you know, the, the, the kind of people who don't fit your model, um, of, of unrelieved trauma. So, you know, that's worth thinking about in terms of transgenerational stuff. I mean, I think most obviously, um, what do anthropologists get obsessed about? But, you know, system, different systems of kinship and family structure. Um, so again, if you're, if you're adopting a very narrow conception of what a transgenerational transmission is, um, then um, it's not going to necessarily work in environments where a kinship structure might be very different or more, more extended or, you know, a, a wholly different kind of concept of, of, of set of relations. Um, so then you might get into really productive comparative discussions uh, about how communities might um, uh, engage with trauma across generations that is very different from 
um, that early model of transgenerational transmission, which is all about hidden, silent secrets encrypted in the in in the parents' mind and passed on as a you know gap uh, to their to their children. So that's the kind of model of of the Holocaust. Um, you know, transmission of, of trauma transgenerationally, it comes out of that um, uh, Nicholas uh, Abraham and, and, and Maria Torek work on encrypting trauma. Um, and again, you know, it's a very specific, located, culturally uh, quite narrow conception of family and kinship. So maybe there's some, some work to be done there which ties into um, comparative anthropology where you might sort of think about this in other ways. I mean, one of the things that I've been um, working on recently uh, is this history of, of burial practice and so on. And that's been really, it's been really kind of forward in my thinking about this. And I got really interested in the Taraja culture in, um, in Indonesia, uh, which has very, very specific um, cultural practices of burial, which, you know, last for over a year. Uh, and uh, end with this kind of gigantic ceremony, lots of sacrifices of, of, of animals, and, uh, and 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 then you are, um, then your coffin is nailed to a certain height in the in 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 the uh, cliffs, limestone cliffs, and it's a spectacle for Western um, tourists. You know, it's a whole dark tourist kind of movement there that kind of looks at them. Uh, and actually, even the anthropologists are sort of saying, well, we don't really understand why this is. This has been amped up even more because it has consumed so many resources of the, of the of the local village communities why in the middle of an economic crisis is this going even higher in terms of its kind of expression and they're kind of completely bewildered and actually it's it's about the kinship structure and the understanding of kinship within the, the within those communities which make for a much better understanding of this it's not a spectacle of 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 um of exotic death actually it makes perfect logical sense within that you just need to kind of understand the trans transgenerational really specifically to that culture in indonesia in order to kind of get, get get at it rather than just seeing it as a as an exotic spectacle so there's lots of things there i think but that again you know mignolo's ideas are you know very very pushing of, of uh, provocative pushing you to kind of a, uh, a really quite extreme point but they can be very valuable to then come back to these core ideas from trauma theory of transgenerational haunting of of of, um, of passing on of, of of trauma. You know, it has to be uh, indigenous and local and specific in an anthropological way. I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have another question, and it reads: Professor Luckhurst, considering the Iraq War and its aftermath. How can we untangle the impact of colonial histories from the trauma experienced by individuals and communities in the region? And what approaches can contribute to a more comprehensive understanding and healing process? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? That's, re that, that's really good. Thank you. Um, the Yeah, it's, it's, it's so difficult, I think, um, to, to kind of... Um, uh, disentangle not least because it's ongoing, but but disentangle this sort of sense of of of, of trauma uh, in relationship to you know uh, war situations particularly. And again, it's a it's a need to understand perhaps local um, uh, and and uh, specific culturally specific kind of um, environments where um, projects might uh, projects to alleviate trauma or, or address trauma might need to be kind of really uh, localized and an understanding of the kind of local context um so the thing to do is not um blood that kind of um uh, war zones with a kind of western conception of, of psychiatry and we've we've learned that even in um in 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 the west between 9 11 which famously sent a whole phalanx of psychiatrists to there and actually arguably induced uh, trauma, secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, all those sorts of things. Um, and uh, there was a sort of learning process to the 7-7 bombings in, in London where they did not do that. And they kind of withheld that, made kind of um, services available, but, but, but not kind of say, you must kind of engage with this. You must be traumatized in this particular kind of way. Um, so, so I think you know if you're talking about the local, um, specific, individual level of of war trauma, that's probably really important. 
um, the, the the kind of larger geopolitical thing is it, it's it, it, uh, currently you know with with all kinds of conflicts kicking off everywhere um it feels very bleak doesn't it in terms of being able to think about you know whether this paradigm can help with any of that um and and uh it's it, it feels like the, 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 there are certain times when a kind of narrative trauma um works more effectively than others but i think during the conflict not especially helpful i think to to think about that um and it's it's much more about you know urgent um ceasefire kind of <laughs> it's the main thing that we would all like i think um for, for, for that and then you can kind of you know work through that but it's such an intractable difficult situation um not least in um not least in iraq and ongoing as well thank you so much sir uh, sir if you will admit can we go with uh, one or two more questions um maybe we can take yeah sure absolutely i'm fine with that if it's time Okay, so the next question says, since the moment of colonialism itself may be a source of trauma, for instance, partition on the heels of India's independence, how efficacious is it then for us to move away from the burden of a colonial history? Yeah, okay, so I don't think that they are, um, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for Mignolo, but I don't think that's what, what that position is kind of arguing at all. And actually, it's it's sort of saying go towards it. In some ways, it's kind of unravel it, you know, kind of really, really explore it uh, in, in a, a, a kind of foundational way, but that you have to do that locally. So for every kind of traumatic borderline, and there are so many, um the, the the borders produce specific histories and in fact um you know another really productive idea uh, from Mignolo's work is the border epistemology so that idea of of thinking about how productive borders are um both to um uh, suppress and um create modernity so national boundaries and and and, and all of those sorts of things and ethnic boundaries and so on uh, religious boundaries um, but also how they um by in in their contact also subvert and uh, undo um this kind of strange um uh effect of the border so uh, increasingly you know people who write on border epistemology or, or borderlands um talk increasingly about it being a, a kind of ever evolving um expanding kind of space uh, so I think legally the border between Mexico and um, America, for example, kind of in, in, incorporates now something like forty percent of the American population because it's it, it's kind of got this it's got this strange kind of extension uh, beyond it. It's not a wall, it's not a borderline. It's become a kind of border space, and within that space, really strange, hybrid, unpredictable things happen. Uh, so I, I think border theory is really interesting uh, at the moment. And obviously you have that situation too on the line of partition and that sort of sense of, of, of the space around it becoming really difficult and problematic and, and uh, extended and contested and, and um, subverted and and so on in very kind of local uh, specific kind of ways. So, I, and I think um, that idea of, 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 of it being a traumatic event, the partition, um, something that is something that Mignolo would want you to move towards and to excavate and to multiply the kind of potential histories of it rather than go into factional spaces where this is my you know version of, of, of this or this is my version of this because that's also happening everywhere um, you know Israel uh, everywhere uh, is is if you have a kind of strictly exclusionary logic, which is what your border is supposed to do, in a Trumpian way, all it does is hybridize uh, and and actually uh, subvert, and that's what the that's the kind of logic that we should look at. And you understand that by understanding the historical specificity of each particular moment. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, there's uh, Dr. Devaditya Bhattacharya, who's a uh, faculty at the department. He would like to ask you a question. May Perfect. I ask you to unmute yourself? Dr. Devaditya? Yeah, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes, 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just a couple of questions. First of all, thank you, Professor Luck Luckhurst, for that that terrific set of questions. I think. I mean, those five questions are things that we take away from 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 the conference. I think, uh, uh, and and I think we will have enough conversations on those questions uh, through the rest of the conference as well. Uh, the first question is, I mean, the kind of uh, decolonial delinkage that you are talking about, right? So, I, I was wondering whether in trying to perform something like that or even attempt something like that do we perhaps need to link trauma studies to the history of capital right and the history of uh, perhaps finance capitalism right so where uh, the, the work of finance capitalism is precisely about normalizing trauma in the everyday right so through precarization of labor right so through through let's say the, the ubiquity of indebtedness right so so and that so so how do we evolve a certain terminology from within trauma studies that can precisely take on right so uh, the question of indebtedness as a question of trauma, right? So as insistently a question of trauma that has been um, inflicted by, by uh, of course, the first world, right? So, and of course, uh, international monetary organizations, right? So the IMF, World Bank, um, a kind of um, you know, conglomerate, right? So on the rest of the world, right? So through structural adjustment programs and all of that, right? So why is it that, that questions of capital have never quite entered the, the, the field of trauma studies is my first question. And related to this is, I think a slightly um, controversial question, but I think, I mean, we might as well just spread controversy, right? So, so uh, which is that, that do you think the, the kind of industrialization of mental health discourse, right, or what one can call a mental health industry, right, so is something that has again taken on and, and kind of given a completely different spin to trauma, right? So by minting it, right? So and and uh, therefore kind of spawning it as an industry elsewhere in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, those are small questions. Um, it's, uh, you're quite right, I think, um, that we should um, think about trauma subjectivity, actually all subjectivity, but trauma subjectivity perhaps in particular, uh, related to situation of of um, you know global capitalism particularly, so there is a you know go to, but actually perhaps um, if you start with the kind of trauma theory which is internal to critical theory, so like Cathy Carruth, who was a student of Paul the Man, uh, it's a very kind of um, Demanian, as she herself says. Um, in in its kind of in, in interior kind of textual sort of focus on things uh, and many people have critiqued that but also critique that from within a history of psychiatry uh, and a history of of, of how uh, the psychodynamic subject which might be traumatized came to be in the 19th century um and and yet i think you're right in saying that we also need to in, in include in that picture um the role of capitalism itself and that becomes incredibly urgent i think it becomes more visible to us uh in uh say the 21st century as well when you have as you say a whole industry of uh narratives about how you might uh resolve your trauma how you might state your trauma but also resolve it and i think i was interested in the 1990s in the trauma trauma confessional so that autobiographical kind of you know here are my origins in trauma but i think the shift uh, in the 21st century is to language of well-being and languages of resilience uh, so that what we want now from that celebrity um you know confessional is actually how they got beyond uh something how they superseded something it's the uh, it, it's the opera Winfrey, Winfrey I can't even say it. Um, it's opera Winfrey. Uh, that sort of sense of of, um, of of you know needing to produce narratives of supersession, and that's what then becomes important. You know, how many podcasts do we need uh, about um, well-being and you know improving our mental health and putting down social media and so on? You know, we see that seems to be a kind of a, a huge industry. Um, really interesting. Uh, use and and again a kind of colonial context for something like meditation uh, and um, uh, and you know these amazing kind of vast fortunes that have been built uh, by people who have meditation apps and getting you to sleep apps and you know getting over work problems shutting down your day apps 
all those sorts of things. Uh, it's definitely a well-being industry, and that's been that's been written about quite extensively on the left as well. So I think all subjectivity is is defined by its by its context. Trauma studies, perhaps, need, uh, in some senses, does connect to that wider stuff. Um, I would point to my late great friend um, Mark Fisher and his work on um, subjectivity, capitalism, uh, and um, and trauma and well-being kind of narratives. He was very important um, for many of us in, in how he was thinking that through. Um, and you know the whole kind of um, body of work on uh, which is a critique of, of of well-being and a critique of the kind of very narrow subjectivized. Uh, psychiatrized language of, of of trauma when you need it to to understand the context that we're in uh is it is an inducement of kind of traumatic shocks economic shocks uh are things that we also need to factor in so i mean i think i'm i think i'm on your side um and and that that, that i think we can incorporate that and probably needs to be more incorporated into it colonialism itself being you know a product of of, of that capital accumulation as well. Thank you so much, sir. We have another question from uh, Professor Michela Borgaza, and uh, this will be the last question for today. Sure. And it reads, a set of African and Caribbean history historians, writers, and thinkers have emphasized the notion of entanglement and how continents, because of traumatic legacy of slavery and colonialism, are uh, uh, are intimately connected as Ashish Nandi also talks about the intimate enemy within the Indian context. Is there a way in which Magnolo's notion of delinking addresses this intimate entangled legacy? And how do we approach those literary texts that specifically engage with this issue? Yeah, it's a really good question. Really important question, I think. So my my slide has so I'm trained in um you know the the 80s and 90s so uh, and I I was very kind of you know committed um Derrida um kind of reader and, and and read everything as it came out and was kind of very um um excited by that sort of stuff so I I find it quite challenging in a useful way that Mignolo is kind of saying that that sort of um idea of 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 complicity of the complicitous subject and 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 the idea of complicitous concepts uh that that you need to deconstruct which means not get rid of but actually you know um you have to still keep using these because this is the framework that we have but you have to unravel them from within i find that um much more uh productive than than uh, you know this is why i'm provoked by Mignolo, this idea of delinkage does that mean full delinkage um do we have to get rid of that entirely is there is there something problematic about that um can, can we no longer use the word then trauma because it's it's entirely bound up in in this colonial matrix or can we uh, actually is it about understanding linkage understanding the the kind of you know nature of these the, these things that that you can't quite ever delink. You might want to, and you might need to, but there is this kind of there's something fundamentally um, productive or generative about ideas uh, of of this. Um, so uh, then, latterly, when I became much more interested in perhaps uh, um, material history, discursive history, um, the person I went to for this was uh, Bruno Latour, and I'm using I'm using him because. Of that word entanglement, um, because uh, Latour always talks about concepts as knots, as things that are tangled up, and that his job is to disentangle the knot and tell you what everything that's gone into that kind of really tightly bound knot. Uh, and trauma is a really, really complex, difficult knot that I took out several strands from in my work um, 16 years ago. But I now need to see all of the other strands actually that that are also bound into that knot and it, and and I make it so messy and entangled. Um, that um, that and that will include this kind of colonial history and this sort of sense of 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 um, complicity of these kinds of interconnections that that once made, particularly once made violently, can't really be undone or moved beyond. So so I'm not entirely sure that. That the, um, I would want to follow the full logic to the end of what delinkage might suggest, because I think 
it's it's precisely the knottiness or entangledness of these kinds of things in local specific contexts that is the most valuable thing for us to do. Thank you so much, sir. And I would like to thank you, Professor Lackhurst, for that intellectually stimulating speech and for so generously taking out the time from your busy schedule to deliver this uh, keynote address and also for taking uh, answering all the questions in such great detail. Thank you so much, sir. And hopefully we can have you over at the department sometime if we can, you know, work that out. So, yeah, that'd be um, lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, um, brilliant job done by the organisers. Um, I have to go off to a, um, a horrible editorial meeting now, but I'm hoping to drop in um, tomorrow. You will have fantastic um, uh, array of, of um, keynotes uh, that you've managed to get, and uh, I hope they're productive. But also, really, you know, voices from the floor is the really kind of crucial thing that, that we need, and the specificity and detail that all of your speakers, everyone is important here uh, to, to contribute to this narrative. So thank you, and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, Professor Lucas. So, so grateful to you. You're welcome to me. It's been, it's been great. It's been great. Thank